one of you. Yeah, they are. And uh, we're glad that God has blessed us with this beautiful day to come together in, in the Lord's house and uh, worship Him. I'm glad that you're able to be here, and I'm glad for the folks that are uh, sitting in the parking lot listening on the radio. Um, I, uh, I truly, truly believe, I was telling uh, Bobby Case a little bit earlier this morning, I truly believe that it's important for those to come even though they are not comfortable being inside yet because uh, it's, it's important for us to get together and it's important for us to see each other. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, it just, uh, I think, well, I've heard reports of uh, different people struggling with depression and I'm sure that it's uh, probably related to uh, just how much we've been restricted in our interaction with each other. So uh, it's an important thing to be together and I'm glad that you have uh, come today uh, to worship the Lord. Before we start, I want to go over a few announcements, uh, several uh, printed in the bulletin and I hope you'll keep those in mind. We. Uh, I guess the big uh, event for today, other than this uh, time together, uh, will be a baptismal service this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And uh, several announcements we put in a bulletin regarding that to uh, give you information and uh, let you know what, what is uh, available. And if you would like to uh, carpool, uh, that would be a good thing. Maybe uh, two or three of you could meet here and then take one vehicle over to Karen's house just to save a little space for parking. And then uh, if there's people that are interested, we'll, we'll even take the church van. Uh, but we want to leave about 3.30 for that because I want to be there plenty of time to make sure I know what's going on and uh, get things ready to go. So keep those announcements in mind for this afternoon. And then, uh, since we're doing the baptismal service today, we won't be doing our missionary service tonight. We're going to put that off till next Sunday night. Uh, at 6 o'clock will be our missionary service where we try to provide uh, some of the latest information that we've received from missionaries that we have supported. And then also uh, keep in mind that at uh, the end of the month we're going to do our uh, sixpiration service again. Um, let's see here. Remember that bringing snacks and stay after the baptism? Yes. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are coming to the baptismal service, I uh, just want you to be aware that you're invited to come back here to the fellowship hall uh, after the uh, baptism and uh, just have a time of refreshments and snacks and visiting or fellowship and visiting together. Yes? Uh, what kind of snacks? Are we talking potato chips or cakes? Finger foods? Well, we're going to have forks, so it can be cakes, but not anything. Just snacky stuff, anything. But we'll have forks. It, it can be real food or dessert. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sure that whatever it is, we'll eat it. Uh, are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning that we've forgotten? All right, let's bow our heads for, for prayer and then Chris will come and lead us as we start our worship. Our Father in heaven, we truly thank you and praise you for giving us this opportunity to be in your house today and worship and to fellowship and join together with our brothers and sisters in the family of God. We pray that you would bless us today in this service and help us to feel your presence. We have come here, Lord, to meet with you, to praise and glorify your name and to hear your voice as you speak to our hearts, I pray that every part of this service today would be anointed by your presence and that 
we would bring glory to the name of Jesus. In his name we ask it. Amen. Good morning. The call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 61, verse 10. <clears throat> I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Well, for those of you who want to, you can take out your blue hymnals. Turn with me to number 179 as we sing Awesome God.
worship, let's turn to page number 87. I just want to tell you something about this song. Number 87. We listen to Christian radio, Sonia and I do. And every time this song and some other old hymns like that come on, I said, oh, there goes another A.G. Dewald song. As I remember Professor or Principal A.G. Dewald whenever I was just a kid in grade school and, and uh, the ninth grade before we moved away from there. On Fridays, we had assembly in the auditorium for the whole school every Friday, and our principal would go up there and lead us in songs like this, and I'll never forget, Ferris, Lord Jesus, that's one of the songs, that's where I learned it, and then he'd read the Bible, and then we'd all stand and say the Lord's Prayer, and salute the flag, and sing patriotic songs, and then whatever else was going on, and I thought as I was looking at this song, after Brother uh, Lester gave me the songs for the week, I was looking at it. And a lot of people in this world worship the sun, the moon, or whatever. But this guy is pointing out how we need to worship the God of the sun, and the God of the moon, and the God of the heavens. What a wonderful message. I'd just like you to think about that as we can let it go. Yes. I am so thankful. Oh, yes. How grateful I am for those days when we... I uh, had those privileges and blessings. All right, let's, we can still do this, though. Let's do it with all of our heart and worship and praise the Lord, okay? Let's stand together on this great song.
jump the gun here. Uh, I was so excited about that singing, <laughs> uh, I forgot that uh, Pat's going to read the scripture for us here, but it's a good thing to know we're saved, isn't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That sounds like good camp meeting singing this morning, and I uh, appreciate everyone doing your best. Uh, Pat's going to read our scripture lesson this morning. Thank you, Pat. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we do have uh, our prayer list in the bulletin again, and hope you will um, keep those names that are listed there on your mind throughout this week uh, as we pray. We want to uh, faithfully hold each other up before the Lord, and uh, I don't believe there were any names added this week, Chris? I don't think there were any names added. I do want to mention a name that's not on the list. Uh, we got a, a message through our church Facebook page this week, a couple of days ago, uh, from one of our neighbors right up the road here, Doran uh, Mace, uh, the man at runs the clock shop uh, right up here. Uh, he sent a message to our church a couple of days ago through the Facebook page and asked if we would uh, remember to pray for their daughter, Ashley. Uh, she's going through a number of different uh, problems uh, right now, and it's uh, her and her family need the Lord's touch. He asked if we would remember to pray for her. So... Uh, I don't know what her last name is, but uh, her name is Ashley. So uh, remember her in our, our prayers today and throughout the week. And he surely asked us to pray for her granddaughter, Melanie. She's very sick. Oh, okay. All right. Shirley Rice's granddaughter, Melanie. 
sure that, yes. Situation that maybe no one else knows about. 
And uh, we pray, oh God, that your spirit would work and help in every situation. Remember those who need to be saved and, and need to be born again with spiritual life from above and, and their lives transformed and changed by your grace. I pray that today you would speak to them to this morning and talk to their hearts. Father, we pray for those that are uh, dealing and struggling with broken relationships and other kinds of problems. Maybe it's a financial situation uh, or employment situation, Lord. We just pray that you would have your way. Get glory to your name, O oh God, because you are worthy and you deserve to be praised. Lord, we pray that you would remember uh, those that lead our nation. We think of our country and and the situations that we're facing, the conditions of our society and how far we have drifted away from God's word and the principles of righteousness and morality. And Lord, uh, we truly are living in a day where evil is called good and good is called evil. And we're desperately in need of a spiritual awakening all across this land. Yes. We pray, oh God, that you would visit us once again by a mighty revival uh, across this great nation, Lord, and speak to our leaders and those in authority. Give them wisdom from above and humility to call on the name of the Lord, and to do your will, and to understand, Lord, what you desire. Have your way in each of our lives. Let us be the witness that you want us to be wherever we go, and we'll give you the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Chris and I are going to uh, do this special song today. My understanding is that this song is a song that was uh, discovered, uh, written by Fanny Crosby, but was never published until just recent years. And uh, a few years ago, we went to a concert down in Slippery Rock and heard uh, Ernie Haas and Signature Sound. Uh, and they told us about this song that uh, was discovered. And uh, they asked uh, Ernie Haas and his group to uh, put music to these words and to, to uh, record it, publish it. And so they did. And uh, we're going to try to sing it this morning. But it's a song that says, Give Me Jesus. And you know, I've said this before, I've, it's not original with me, I've read it uh, a long time ago, but someone said one time, uh, when, I found out my, when I found myself in a situation where Jesus was all that I had, then I discovered that he was all I needed. And I think that we have been going through those kinds of circumstances in our world now, where a lot of the things that people uh, depended on have been taken away or changed drastically. And uh, I just pray that it will bring us to the point where we recognize that Jesus is the one we need. Amen. Amen. I'd like to testify before we sing. I was thinking about this during the night and this morning. I just appreciate the Lord's presence. Amen. And you know, there are times when you feel him especially near. And yesterday, I was busy all day. All day long. And I just told the Lord in the morning when I prayed, I just have to have strength for today because I've got a lot on me. And he was there all day long. I felt his presence all day. And I was thinking about this. My mind goes back many times to when my dad got saved when I was nine years old. If that hadn't happened, I don't know what would have happened to me. But I'm so grateful that I am saved. I'm thankful that I know I'm saved and that I have his presence and I'm thankful that I can say, just give me Jesus. Amen.
one of the things that, one of the reasons why that song blesses my heart is just thinking about the person who wrote it, a lady that was blind, and uh, she wrote, I think, hundreds of songs, but uh, in all of her handicap and uh, ways that she might have been limited because of her blindness, yet uh, so many of her songs, so many of her hymns give uh, expression to the deep relationship with Christ and what he meant to her. Praise God. Well, most of you know that we've been doing a series of messages through the New Testament book of 1 John, a letter that uh, in our English uh, Bibles uh, been divided up into five chapters. And um, I wanted to begin this morning by sharing a couple of uh, interesting circumstances regarding this series. Um, last Sunday, we were planning to uh, celebrate communion and uh, I was thinking ahead and, and uh, trying to decide <clears throat> the message the Lord wanted me to have for that Sunday for communion. And I actually toyed with the idea of jumping out of this series for uh, a week so that I could focus more specifically on, uh, on communion. But as I began to read over and, and study the, the very next section that we were ready to do on the, the second half of chapter 4, uh, I noticed that it very, very appropriately fitted the, the uh, subject of communion because we were talking about the love of God and what all that that uh, meant and how, what he provided. So I stayed with the series and, and we looked at the second part of chapter 4 last Sunday. Well then, uh, thinking ahead to this Sunday, I was uh, obviously thinking about the baptismal service this afternoon and oh boy, it, it probably would be nice to uh, maybe have a message that focuses something along that line, just to be a reminder to everyone. and and. Um, Again, I got the, the scriptures and was beginning to prepare for this uh, message today. And I looked at the, uh, John's letter here and looked at chapter 5 where we would be ready to, to uh, continue if we did that. And I was uh, really uh, pleased to discover that these first five verses of chapter 5 uh, really do fit uh, nicely with this whole uh, plan for today of the baptismal service this afternoon uh, and one of the things that I uh, that kind of solidified it in my mind was uh, one of the commentaries that I've been using uh, as we study for this uh, series is a commentary written by Dr. Vic Reisner who is one of our elders in the Fellowship of Bible Churches and um, uh, when I looked in his commentary the heading that he had for uh, the outline covering this section of uh, chapter 5, the, that heading said, The Marks of Genuine Conversion. And uh, when I read that, that phrase or that the heading that he had for the outline of this uh, part, uh, it just clicked in my mind, well, this is certainly appropriate for a message of, that relates to baptism and relates to salvation. And so I chose the title that I have uh, in the bulletin there, what, what It Means to Be Saved. And uh, just these last two Sundays, especially uh, as the scripture we were ready to look at just fell nicely with the events that we wanted to, to observe with communion and now baptism, two of our, the, the two main sacraments that we, uh, that we believe in and celebrate. And, uh, and so it just confirmed in my mind that uh, the messages as well as the, the uh, celebration of communion and baptism are all orchestrated by the Holy Spirit and He's guiding this, this all along and I certainly appreciate that. There's nothing that a preacher uh, 
uh, wants more or, or desires more and loves more than to have that confidence and that sense of, of confirmation from the Lord that uh, that you're in His will as far as preaching and and uh, and doing those things that relate to that. So I thank the Lord today. The title of the sermon implies a rather broad topic. There's a number of things that we could. If we were doing a topical sermon, there's a number of things we could include under this title, uh, what it means to be saved, because it does entail a number of uh, themes uh, throughout the, the entire Bible. But uh, in the passage we're looking at this morning, which is uh, chapter 5 of 1 John and the first five verses, we're going to be limiting our uh, theme or our our uh, thoughts today to what John addresses here, and uh, and that uh, contains three different uh, topics that we'll uh, be pointing out here this morning. In another commentary that I uh, use frequently, published by it's called a Tyndale uh, New Testament commentary, and the author of the the commentary on uh, the Epistles of John is uh, an English preacher by the name of John R.W. Stott. And in his commentary, he tells us this. I want to just quote from him as we introduce this passage. He said, John uh, uh, repeatedly presented in his letter three tests for those professing to be Christians. In chapter 2, he described all three tests in order. Obedience, love, and belief or faith. In chapter 3, he treats only obedience and love. And in chapter 4, he covers faith and um, obedience, or faith and love. Chapter 3 is obedience and love, and chapter 4 is belief and love. Now, however, in the brief opening paragraph of chapter 5, we meet all three together again. The words believe and faith occur in verses 1, 4, and 5. The word love occurs in verses 1, 2, and 3. And the need to obey and carry out his commands uh, shows up in verses 2 and 3. So in these five uh, verses, just a very short part of chapter 5, John is again reminding us of these three key elements uh, that are a part of the Christian life, the Christian faith. And so, with the help of the Holy Spirit this morning, I want to speak to you from these five verses concerning what it means to be saved. Point number one is that being saved means that we genuinely believe certain truths. In verse uh, one, uh, the first part of that verse, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And then verse 5, or, well, verses 4 and 5 contain the word believe. Uh, verse 4, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And so, with verse 1 and verse 4 and verse 5, we have the, the concept of faith or believing presented as an essential part of what it means to be saved. The Bible clearly tells us that we are saved by grace through faith in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. It also tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, it's an unwavering confidence that the things we can't see are still real. They're still trustworthy. They can be depended on and relied on. And so John is reminding us that it's important for uh, salvation. It's important to be saved uh, and knowing that faith is a key element of what it means to be saved. And so uh, it seems like uh, as I was looking and studying at these verses, there are at least three things that he is emphasizing that we need to believe. Now there's probably, uh, there are many other things presented throughout the Bible. But in these verses, there are three things that, 
that John touches on. The first one is, we believe the truth about Jesus. And, and uh, again, the first part of verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. In both places, his focus is on Christ. His focus is on Jesus and, uh, and it's e emphasizing the fact that it's important what we believe about him. I think I've probably said this many times in the past, but many different scholars have pointed out that you can, you can detect a false doctrine or false religion by examining what they have to say about Jesus. Uh, there's a, a number of different religions in our world today that uh, would readily acknowledge that Jesus was a great teacher or he was a, a great moral man, that he was a great prophet or he was a great miracle worker or whatever they might say. But they, uh, they continually fall short of saying that he was the divine son of God and equal with God and therefore he was God. Uh, and so John is reminding us he says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, and we've talked about this in some of the earlier chapters, where John frequently uses the name Jesus, which was his earthly name, with the name Christ, which is more of a title. Christ meant anointed one. It was a, it was a title indicating that he was the Messiah. He was the one that God prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. And, uh, and we've talked uh, previously in this uh, series of messages how that the false teachers that were gaining prominence in John's day did not believe Jesus was really the Messiah. They did not believe the man, Jesus, was really the Son of God because of their belief that everything material, everything physical in this world was made up of, of matter which is evil. And so John is bringing them to this uh, crisis of faith, if you will, that you must believe that Jesus is the Christ. You must believe that he is the Son of God. And in order to say that, we are saying, as a man, he was perfect. And he was compassionate. And he was compelling in his message. He, he uh, gave a strong, compelling, convincing message as a man. But he was more than a man. He was also the Son of God. He was the Christ. And as Christ, he was divine. And he was our Redeemer. And he was our miracle worker. Praise the Lord. And you cannot do away with either one of those without greatly damaging what the Bible tells us that, about Jesus and who he is. And John is ex explaining that when we believe, we are born of God. When we believe, we are experiencing the new birth. We believe Jesus is who he said he was. We believe Jesus is who the Bible says he is. And we believe that he is God in the flesh. Just like John said back in the gospel, the word became flesh. Hallelujah. We believe that he did what he said he would, that he did what he said he would do. And that is to shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. Jesus clearly told his disciples that that was what he was doing when he was going to the cross. We not only believe the truth about Jesus, but we believe the truth about the world. In verses 4 and 5 it says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth Jesus is the Son of God? Now this truth, I believe, points back and it harkens back to chapters 2 and 3, where John clearly links the world, quote unquote, the idea of the world, he links that with the problem of sin in those two chapters. The false teachers that John was opposing believed that it wasn't possible to be free from sin because we are in the world and we are of the world. We're made up of physical matter, therefore we are evil. However, John makes it clear that whoever sins, this is what he says in the previous chapters, whoever sins is of the world. 
Now he's addressing the same issue, but he's using the term world rather than sin. And, he, and the point is still the same. The world represents all that is opposed to the will of God and to righteousness. When we talk about the world, we're not talking about the earth. We're not talking about the globe that it's a part of our solar system that we live on. We're talking about a system of values. We're talking about a, a philosophy. We're talking about a, a ruling or guiding principle of life that is anti-God and, and leaves God out of the picture. That's the world. And John is reminding us that uh, we who are born of God overcome the world. And he is uh, emphasizing that we need to understand what the world is. We need to have the truth about the world in order to be able to have that kind of faith. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, this is what John said. Do not love the world or the things in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it is of the world. We talked about that a few weeks ago. But notice that John is clearly telling us it's one or the other. Christians cannot hang on to the world and love the world and still claim to love the Father. And you can't love the Father and still claim to love the world in this regard. Uh, we're not talking about loving sinners. We're talking about loving this world system. And so believing or faith involves knowing what to believe about the world, its desires, its values, the morals of this world. They will always be contrary to God's will. We need to remember that. Yeah. The world, the direction of the world, the, the impulses and values and priorities of the world is always going to be opposed to what God wants and what God says. Amen. And, uh, and the devil, you, you know as well as I do, if you've lived very long at all, and I think most of us have. I uh, don't see any babies in our congregation right now. The children have gone to junior church. We've all lived long enough to know that the devil is very good at coming around. Whenever God says it's this way, the devil comes around just like he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden and says, well, it can be this way. You can do it this way. Let me remind us, dear friends, this morning that that is the world. And John says, if you have the love of the world, you can't have the love of the Father and vice versa. That's right. And so whatever God says, that's it. Mm -hmm. And the world is going to try to press us into its mold, like Paul said to the, the Romans. Do not be conformed to this world. The world wants to press us into its mold. It wants to teach us or tell us and convince us, you don't have to go quite just the way God says. That's a little bit uh, stiff. That's a little bit strict. That, that's a little bit unreasonable. You can go this way. Be warned, dear friends, that, that is the, that's the method that the devil uses a lot. Right. We must believe the truth about the world, and we must believe the truth about victory. Again, we're getting this out of verses 4 and 5. But John is specifically teaching that we can and should be victorious over the world. We don't have to be defeated. We don't have to succumb to the, the pressure of the world around us, but we can be victorious. The false teachers didn't believe that it was possible to live without sin. In fact, uh, some commentaries uh, pointed out in, the, in the, this letter that they actually seem to celebrate sin. The, the fact of sin was just proof of their humanity and, and, uh, and they believed that all matter was evil anyway, so it's only natural that we're going to do wrong things. It's only natural that we're going to sin. And, and John is bringing them back to the truth that, that whoever is born of God overcomes the world. There is victory in Jesus. Amen. There is victory to overrule and overpower whatever the devil is suggesting for us that we can uh, kind of deviate from what God requires and what God asks. 
So we have to believe the truth about victory. John is boldly proclaiming that being born of God and believing in Jesus as the divine Son of God makes it possible to live victoriously. And I know from experience some of the things that, that I've battled with the devil in my life, and I'm sure that every one of us have, there are those times the devil comes around and says, oh, well, you can't really expect to be victorious over that. You can't really expect to have whatever. And he's very good at that. And I would say to us this morning, we should never allow ourselves to buy into the idea that it just isn't possible to be victorious. Because if we remain true to the Lord and, and keep praying and seeking Him, and, and God is faithful, I can testify that God is faithful and the Holy Spirit will give victory. Praise the Lord. Amen. The second point I realize in the, these verses, being saved means that we sincerely love God and love others. Which again, is a message that John has repeatedly emphasized in this letter. In verses 1 and 2 it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now this is an interesting thing that John is, is uh, teaching us here and pointing out to us. When I read uh, verse 1, the, the first few times, said, it seemed to me that John was saying, whoever loves the one who begot, or begat, whichever, if you're using the New King James, it says begot. In the King James, it says begat. Um, if you love him that begat, then you will love him that is begotten of him. <laughs> and right away, I, as I read that, I thought, well, that's talking about the, the Father and talking about the Son, the begotten Son of God. But... Um, as I studied and was reading the different commentaries about that verse, uh, I think all of the commentaries that I consulted were pretty unanimous in, in saying, no, this phrase, uh, begotten of him, refers to Christians, other Christians. And here's the reason why they came to that conclusion. When John says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, that verb, born of God, is the same word as translated begat, and it's the same root word that's translated begotten. And so John apparently is connecting those three together. He's saying, when we believe Jesus is the Christ, not only are we born, but we love the one who born us, and we love others that he has born, if I could use it in that term. And so he's, he's using that phrase repeated three times in that verse, is that uh, Greek word, and he's emphasizing the fact that we are born of God. We have new birth when we believe in Jesus the Christ. And when we do, when that happens, when we are born and new life springs up in us, then we love God, the one who gave us new birth. And we love the people that God has also given new birth. Because we're all children of God. We've Amen. all been born by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Because of John's repeated arguments about Jesus being the Son of God and being the Christ, it is somewhat natural to think that he's talking about Jesus here. Because my mind automatically went to uh, uh, John 3.16, which is the same John writing, and he says uh, that God gave his only begotten Son. Uh, but it, it actually means that we love the Lord who gave us birth and we love the others that God has also given spiritual birth. We've been placed in a great big family, our brothers and sisters in the family of God. And I've said many, many times over my life, I, I can tell you honestly, there have been times where I've had much better fellowship and sweeter fellowship with the people of God and the family of God and my brothers and sisters in the family of God than I have with my own blood family and relatives. Uh, not that I hate my family, I don't. Uh, 
uh, we get along fine, but, uh, but the fellowship is sweeter. The fellowship is greater with God's children. Amen? I thank the Lord for that. Just like faith and believing, love is another theme that John has repeatedly emphasized in his letter. Apparently, the lack of love was a real problem among the recipients of, of his letter. Otherwise, he wouldn't have mentioned it so many times. I forget how many, I think I actually wrote it down back here at the beginning of this. Um, yeah, the word love appears 46 times in this, uh, in this letter. So um, it, it's very important to John, and he's trying to get this message of, Across and apparently the lack of love was a real problem. And I began to think about that. And well, it kind of makes sense to me because it's always been a typical problem whenever false teaching is present among Christian churches or Christian circles. Those that are teaching the errors can be prone to unkindness and putting people down who don't accept what they're teaching and uh, demeaning them and saying unkind things to them. But that's not all. Sometimes the people that are defending the truth can be just as mean and unkind in the defense of the truth. And I wouldn't doubt that what that was going on here among these people that John is writing to. There's error growing up among the Christians. There's error growing up in the church. And John is in, impressing on them 46 different times. He talks about the word love in this letter, just five chapters. I would ask myself the question and all of us this morning, does anyone get the impression that I truly love God by watching my life? Or by watching your life? Is there evidence in my daily life that I love God? Remember, we said this last week, love isn't just a feeling. Love isn't just an emotion. Love isn't just words. Love, as the Bible portrays it, is an action. Amen. And so do my actions show that I love God? Well, they should. Right? They should. Amen. But it goes a step further than that. Do my actions show that I love others? That I love God's children? I think those are serious questions that these people needed to ask themselves, but we need to ask ourselves also because being saved means that we love God and we love others. John, uh, John says in chapter 4, verse 11, Be, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Amen. The third thing I would point out from these verses being saved means we carefully obey God's commands. Verse 3 says, This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous, or some translations say burdensome. For the Apostle John, love and obedience cannot be separated. Jesus himself emphasized the need to show love by obeying. Jesus says in one of his prayers to his Father in heaven, I have obeyed what you have given me to do. I have followed it. I have completed it. He came into our world to show his love to the Father by obeying his will, obeying his word. And Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Love and obedience go together. Faith and obedience go together. But he also emphasized the fact that loving him wasn't, a, wasn't about carrying around heavy burdens, but it was learning who he was and that his yoke is easy. His burden is light. So uh, Jesus got on to the Pharisees. He got on to the religious rulers and leaders of his day. In Matthew 23, verse 4, it says he's talking about these people that are religious. 
and looked up to. They're considered to be uh, the ruling religious leaders, if you will. And it, this is what he says about them. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And that's typical with people that are just religious. With people that don't have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, there's not that love that flows in their hearts and through their lives for the Lord or for other people. They are obsessed with lining everybody else up and placing heavy burdens on everybody else and making sure that they uh, uh, dot their I's and cross their T's, we might say. But they won't help. Like, you're on your own. Figure it out. Jesus is condemning that kind of an attitude and he says these people like to bind on heavy burdens. But then earlier in the gospel of Matthew chapter 11, this is what Jesus said on one of his occasions. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, one of the biggest lies of the devil is that if you serve Jesus, it'll be a hard, hard road. If you want to have an easier life, you need to go the way of the world. You need to follow Satan, or, or at least follow your own desires, which essentially is following Satan. But I want to tell you this morning, I've, I've seen many, many cases enough to convince me that those who refuse to follow the Lord because he requires too much end up finding themselves bound with burdens far heavier than Christ ever would have laid on them find themselves with habits and addictions or grief and sorrow and pain and whatever the world uh, and, and pursuing the world might bring into their life. I've seen a lot of times in, in the years of my life and my ministry how that uh, people turn away from Christ because it just requires too much. It's too hard. You can't do that. But I tell you, dear friends, the the devil is not an easy taskmaster, is he? He's not an easy taskmaster. And uh, it reminds me of the sad, sad stories we read in the, in the Old Testament how the people of Israel abandoned the Lord. They, they disobeyed God. They repeatedly broke His commandments. They repeatedly uh, worshipped idols and burnt sacrifices to idols and did all of the things that God told them not to do. And I'm, I mean, I obviously didn't live in those days and I can't uh, say for sure what was going through their mind, but you get the impression that these people uh, were refusing to follow God because God requires too much. I just want to do what the rest of the world is doing. But if you read those stories in the Old Testament, different times, under the rule of, of specific evil kings of Israel and Judah. It talks about people that should have been devoted to the Lord, should have been giving their sacrifices to God and obeying His word. Here they are bringing their children and sacrificing them in fire to a God called Moloch. You say, wow, how can people do that? How can they turn away from one thing that they say is too stringent and then go right and do something else that's far more stringent, far more sacrifice than what they had ever been called on before. I don't, un I don't understand that, but I know that it happens. I know that people time after time have turned away from the Lord only to pay a far higher price in terms of suffering and sorrow than what... Uh, would have happened if they would have followed Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about what it means to be saved. When we turn away from our sins and we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, then we are born again. Then we are born of God. And I like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. There's a transformation that takes place. Praise the Lord. And that's really what baptism is, is all about. That's what baptism is signifying. Something's happened in my life. Something's happened in my heart. And I've made a decision by the grace of God to turn away from my sin. And now I'm a new creature because Christ has made me brand new. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. I was also reminded in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. Jesus says to his disciples, they had been out preaching the gospel. They'd been out sharing the message and driving out the uh, demons, spirits. And they came back to the Lord and the Bible says they were rejoicing that even the demons were subject to them. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Don't rejoice because the demons and spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your name are written in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. And there's a song we're going to sing as our closing song this morning. There's a new name written down in glory. It's a good testimony song. And uh, it tells the story of conversion through the verses of that song. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, and uh, we're going to sing this song on the screen or in your book, number 521. sing through this closing song if there's any particular parts of it that resonates in your heart and you say well that's me uh, just raise your hand and testify as you sing uh, because this really is uh, one of those kind of songs I was once a sinner
name is written in glory, that you have uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Redeemer, and uh, the one who cleanses us from sin. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence today. We're glad that we have been here in your house and worshiping you with your people. I pray that your blessing would go with us and help each and every one of us this week to honor you and all that we do and all that we say. I pray that our life will be a witness, that others will be able to see in us our love for God and our love for God's children, God's people. We'll give you the glory for everything that you do, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Have a good week. See you this afternoon.